Hi, my name is Brian Capo, and welcome to this week's Ask Brian part of our weekly newsletter. Uh, our weekly newsletter is called Monday Morning Data Science. You can sign up in the video description below. Uh, we put it out, hopefully, on Monday most weeks. Sometimes we forget and do it on Tuesday. Um, at any rate, also, if you get a chance, subscribe to my YouTube channel. So I'm going to answer three questions I got this week because it's around time to be thinking about these things for many students. And all these concerns, sort of, you know, basically how to get into a PhD or, you know, this also applies equally to a master's program. Um, and then some other considerations. So the three questions that I got, and I got these a while ago, so I'm sorry for taking so long to answer them. Uh, one was, um, you know, what kind of GREs do you need to use? Two was how do you select between multiple offers if you get multiple offers for PhD or master's programs? And then three, which I think will, will I, I'm going to, one and three can get answered together because, uh, you know, they really cover the same topic, which was how do admissions committees select applicants? And um, I have quite a bit of information about this, having kind of run an admissions committee, been on admissions committees for 15 years or so, uh, and from multiple departments. So uh, uh, let me go through how admissions committees, what they think of. Okay, so, uh, and, and almost all of them seem to work along these lines. So the first thing for any competitive program, the first thing they try and do is a, is a, is a triage. Um, and that is ways that you can quickly eliminate applications. So, you know, let's say you're a, a, a doctoral program and you get say 200 applications. Um, there's quite a few of them that are, that are in essence kind of non-viable. And if you're applying to a PhD program or if you're planning to prep for a PhD program, you, you know, you want to make sure you get your, your application out of the triage bin and into the ones that are being seriously considered. So some things that that triage you um, are, you know, like very low GREs relative to what's the standard for that field. So like in biostatistics, you know, you need to be, say, above the median on the verbal, uh, you know, above, you know, done, you need to do quite well on the mathematics part, and then you need to um, have done okay on that third section that changes all the time. Um, but, you know, again, that's context field specific. Um, and then some places will have strict thresholds for GREs, GPAs, um, other things like that. And if you're below those thresholds, some different places are, are varying degrees of hardcore to, to how they, um, you know, handle their thresholds. We're kind of loose about it. Um, you know, we will, if there's an applicant that we're really interested in and they're below one threshold, we'll try and figure out a way to, to work around it. But an alternative strategy that places will use is they just have too many applications. And if someone's below some requirement, then they're just going to kick them out or kick them out of the applicant pool. Um, okay, so missing prereqs, I think, is, is always a big one that gets people triaged. So if you're applying to a biostatistics program and you don't really have an adequate linear algebra course would be an example, um, or you don't have enough calculus, um, or you just don't have demonstrated mathematical capacity, then, then there's, you know, I think the number one rule for every admissions committee is don't admit people that you know are going to struggle in the program based on the information you have from the application. So that's like the number one rule. And so missing prereqs is probably the greatest indication that, you know, you would be admitting someone into that circumstance, that you'd be setting someone up for failure if you admitted them, even if they're otherwise great. So you want to make sure you don't have any missing uh, prereqs and things like, uh, you know, a low GPA. I had another video where I talked about what you can do if you have a low GPA. What are some steps you can do? When they basically boils down to you need to take some more classes. You need to post back some classes and get a demonstrated capacity for uh, performing at a high level. So, uh, you know, it's not impossible to overcome a, a low GPA. We've, we've had several people. Um, admitted to our program that went on to be stellar faculty members that had a low GPA. I have to admit, my, my GPA wasn't great the first two years when I was in college. I was um, a swimmer then. I wasn't paying too much attention to my studies. Um, and so you can, you can overcome a low GPA, um, but it, it's going to take time. You have to, you know, ultimately it's going to take some time. 
Okay, so so for me that that you know you know let's say in our department you know this, this two hundred usually gets whittled down to about a hundred with with triage and that you know usually there's two people or so that have to look at the application to triage it, um, but then then things get scrutinized quite a bit more. So then after a triage step, you gen- generally move on to some assessment of quality. You know you have you look at people's letters of recommendation. Um, you want good letters of recommendation from hard classes or meaningful experiences that are relevant to the graduate program. So, you know, if you worked at a job in a grocery store, even if you were a model employee and they say extremely nice things about you, that isn't a great letter. Whereas if you have some famous mathematics professor uh, writing a letter that's saying you're the best student they've seen in 20 years, and this person is noteworthy for having written very uh, good letters. I mean, you know, very critical letters in general. Like that, that becomes a great letter of recommendation. So anyway, letters of recommendations. Of course, your transcripts. Most app, most places are going to go through every class you 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 took um, reasonably carefully, uh, or they'll at least look through your full transcripts. They'll check and see if you've done any research. You know, of course, the quality of the university that. Um, you're applying from often matters, you know, if it's a university that no one's heard of, then something people ha- often have a hard time. And I think that this is a little bit of a controversial um, criteria. I think some people who review applications view quality of university differently than others, but uh, certainly it factors in if you just look on, on average. Uh, you know, things like, do you have any programming experience? Um, you know, the, just general, call, you know, the thing, you know, the, your statement of purpose, you know, These sorts of things. Okay, so so then, unfortunately, you know, let's say you know that might whittle you down to thirty to fifty. Um, where now you have thirty to fifty that you're usually you're usually interested in. This is just you know get, get this off the you know get the rough percentages from this. Not um, not not these aren't the absolute numbers. These are just kind of over a couple of years about what I saw. Um, so then the third is you, you know most places can't even make can't make thirty offers. Um, so then it gets to the kind of hard idiosyncratic things that are a little bit of a, a crapshoot. Um, uh, you know, many places will at this point have some sort of interview um, or visitors weekend where they um, both interview the students, but then also evaluate the students. But they also try and show off the department to help recruit them and put themselves in good light because some of the students they're going to reject are, all, are still going to potentially be faculty members on the job market in five years. So, um, you know, the, 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 the thing I would say is at this point, once you get it down to this far, the, all the people are really good. It's very hard to differentiate between them. And then at that point, it becomes, you know, very, uh, very idiosyncratic relative to the reviewers and people, um, you know, uh, the committee will fight amongst its, uh, amongst itself where different people have different criteria. The department will have considerations as well. You know, for example, in, in our department, there's a mixture of faculty research. And if let's say every single person that we're considering admitting um, works in the, or is interested in the field of genomics, well, that might be a problem for the non-genomics people in the department in that there might be students coming and no one interested in working with them and it would have an impact on the department's um, ability to pursue that non-genomics research or, you know, and vice versa for, you know, if, if you have everyone applying and they all want to do causal inference and um, uh, genomics and there aren't enough people to support the genomics research pro- program. So there's also departmental considerations and things like that that go into admissions decisions at that point as well, balance type issues. Um, so that part I would say is very hard and the only real protection you have against that part, if you've done all the things to get yourself into that final bin, the only real protection you have is, is uh, applying to multiple places uh, because then, on, you know, on average, you know, the, you'll 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 probably get in somewhere if you have if you're making it into the top 30 in every place you apply. Okay, so that's kind of how the process works to some extent. And then let's suppose you're in the fortunate position to have been admitted to multiple places. How do you select between them? And you know, of course, this you, know, you can't give rules about something like this. But I, I thought I'd write down at least some things that if I were to do it all over again. 
um, what I would factor in. Um, so I would certainly factor in the research fo foci of the department. You know, are they a list of things that I'm interested in? I also would highly recommend if you're going into graduate school to, to try to consider yourself somewhat of a blank slate if the program you're applying to allows it. If the program you're applying to really admits you into labs, well, then you kind of have to pick ahead of time. But if you're like our program and you get admitted to the general program and then you select um, what area you're interested in, I would, you know, uh, uh, take some time to actually try out the different areas of research in a department. Uh, the environment, the departmental environment, I think is, is very important. Are, you know, are people happy? Do they work together? Do the faculty collaborate? Do the faculty, you know, do the students hang out together not at work? Do the faculty hang out together not at work? That, that, that sort of thing is very uh, important and it leads to, you know, what might be a happy environment and you're going to be more productive in a happy environment than you're going to be in a super stressed out pressure pot. Um, so you want to look at the environment. You want to look at a, hopefully look at a place that's both good as the, you know, doing great research and is productive and contributing uh, to the field. But then also hopefully it'll have a nice environment. It'll be a place that you like to work at and enjoy and that will help you do your best work as well. You know, obviously you have to factor in geographic considerations. You might have family nearby. You might have a spouse, significant other, uh, children, parents to take care of, any, so something like anything like that. And that all, of course, has to factor in. Um, of course, geography goes into the city itself. You want to, or city or place that the university is sitting in. Some, some people I know are highly dedicated to the idea of living in a big city. Others are want to live in a small college town and the, you know, the lifestyle that you have outside of work changes dramatically um, with regard to, ge to geography. I would also say if you look at a place like uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, we are right, you know, in the health world, we're near two big medical centers, um, you know, Hopkins and University of Maryland. Uh, we're near the NIH, the FDA, the federal government. So that has a set of benefits for our location that don't exist at other places. Uh, you look at a place like Emory in Atlanta, it's right near the Center for Disease Control. So if you're interested in infectious disease that, you know, you're right near the epicenter of infectious disease. Uh, if you look at, you know, a place like Boston, you have Harvard and MIT and all these other places, Boston University, all right, right near each other. Um, you have this kind of intellectual hub, you know, out in uh, San Francisco, you have Silicon Valley. Um, so th that aspect of geography plays in as, as well, if you want, you might want to factor that in. Um, of course, the perception of the program, this goes to things like rankings and things like that. I, I wouldn't weight those too heavily because, you know, again, just like the 20 or 30 students at the top, the you know, 10 or 15 programs at the top are all going to be very good. You're going to be able to get a you know, a nice faculty job at other places, or you'll, you'll be able to pursue a, a career, a good career, um, you know, at any one of these, at any one of the good places. So I think you can differentiate between, you know, what is generally considered a, a poor program from what is considered a, a, a good program, but among the collection of good programs, I think there's, there's more exchangeability than is usually admitted. Um, and then uh, another consideration that I would I would factor in a specific faculty. You might want to go to a place to work with specific fact faculty. I would um, weight this very carefully because faculty can leave. Faculty can change their interest. Faculty can run out of funding. Faculty can decide that they want to downsize their lab. Um, and all of these things are completely out of your control. And so I would be uh, very hesitant to go to a place to work with one specific faculty member um, unless you've really uh, agreed on it with them beforehand or talked with them beforehand about that. Okay, so those are some considerations. I hope this is timely. Maybe it's after applications have been submitted, but, um, but hopefully some of you are working toward applying to a program next year, and hopefully some of you are also uh, deciding between programs to get in. Uh, so I wish you all the best of luck with that. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and we will hear or I'll see you next week.